Siren Kierkegaard, Various Readings Norway and the Norwegians, Volume 2, Chapter 13 Trecho by Robert Gordon Lotha, 1840, pages 149 to 157 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Niles Trecho Trecho, his writings, anthropology, also national morality. Niles, or Nicholas Trecho, was born in Drammen about 90 and died in Christiania about five years ago. Had I belonged to the worshipful body of Freemasons, I should have had the honor of dining with him in July and of attending him to his grave in the September following. As it was, I merely saw him when he paid his visit to Oldenschlager. A venerable old man he was, with hair white as snow, of a spare and thin make. Such men live long. He was in the fullest possession of his faculties to the very last. Indeed, the latest year of his life was spent in writing. He was his own biographer. An account of the even tenor of his life precedes his latest work, to which it serves as an introduction. Every demonstration of respect was shown at his funeral, which was attended by a long line of mourners, consisting of the most respectable inhabitants of the city. He was the Staatsrat and Knight of the Dannenbrog. Like most of the continental officials, he wore his orders about him on appearing in public. Such was the chief philosopher of the North. Holberg and his countrymen of the last chapter were Norwegians only by birth. They wrote in Denmark and as Danes. Now Trechow is a representative of a different class, viz., namely, of those who, born in Norway and educated in Denmark, eventually returned back again to their fatherland. They lived at the time of the Union of Sweden, and so doing transferred their allegiance. Trecho, for instance, was a lecturer in Copenhagen before he was connected with the University of Christiania. Such writers are scarcely through and through Norwegians. I call these men intermediates. The works of Trecho are the class books of the northern metaphysicians. I am not in possession of the whole of them. The titles of such I know are as follows. 1. Anthropology, Copenhagen, A.D. 1808. 2. Philosophical Inquiry, Ibid, in the same place, A.D. 1805. 3. National Morality, Ibid, 1810. 4. On the Nature of Philosophy, Ibid, A.D. 1811. 5. Elements of the Philosophy of History, Ibid, A.D. 1811. 6. On the Nature of Man, Especially in a Spiritual Point of View, Ibid, A.D. 1812. 7. Universal Logic. Ibid. 1818. All these were originally lectures given in the University of Copenhagen. Like all eclectic metaphysicians, Trecho is more acute than original and critical than creative. No man was more familiar with the writings of his predecessors. Hence the German, French, and English trains of reasoning were equally well known to him. His style is clear and elegant. Towards the end of his life he is said to have thought with the ancients more than with the moderns, to have been Greek rather than either German or English. Like the views of all men who profess what is called many-sidedness, for example, the power of finding truth in paradoxes and error in received notions, his politics were passive and expectant rather than active and anticipating. Such being the case, he is to the ultra-liberals of Norway, as Goethe was to those of Germany, and as Coleridge is to those of England, viz., namely, a man that puts indifferentism on higher grounds than those whereon sanguine men love to see it placed. His favorite subject is a question, which is very well understood abroad, but not much considered here, anthropology. His Elements of the Philosophy of History is a purely anthropological work. He calls himself physical rather than material. He disclaims the notions of Lamarck. Man has not been developed out of a monad, but he has been developed out of some condition inferior to his present one. There was once a time when he could neither speak plainly 
nor walk uprightly, just as certainly as there was once a time when he could neither read nor write. The primeval state of man lay within certain limitations. It was never infinitely low in the scale of creation, inasmuch as nature produces parallel types subject to parallel developments. Man grew out of an aquatic, or, I speak as a quinarian, natatorial type. In the inferior stages of his organization, he was not a monkey, but a walrus. The history of the individual is the history of the species. The humankind in general, like the human being in particular, has its ages of childhood, youth, manhood, etc., etc., with their characteristic virtues and vices. The uterus is to the embryo as the tohu vavohu was to the world. Our nature proceeds gradually towards perfection. I mention this last position of Trecho to show that he was none of those philosophers that degrade mankind, con amore. If he thought lowly of our primary origin, he hoped highly for our final destination. If he sunk us lower than the beasts in our infancy, he raised us to the angels in our manhood. There is no prostration of our nature in the works of Trecho, to those who are familiar with the anthropology of the continental philosophers, his creed will contain nothing extraordinary. I believe that as he grew older he mollified his notions. The work from which the above dogmata have been taken was published A.D. 1811, the age of material physiologists and of imperfect geology. The name of the writer, who, above all others, formed the philosophical terminology of the Danish language, was Ilsho. He died at the age of 25, A.D. 1750, having studied philosophy under Wolf. He was a purist, and as such translated Greek words into Danish as often as he was enabled to do. Like other purists, he coined a multiplicity of new words, some of which died with him, whilst others, for example, Bivigrund, Inkelthid, Selfivisted, etc., etc., became incorporated in the language. Here follows an abstract of Trecho's national morality by way of a specimen of his mode of thinking. Law is not arbitrary, but grounded upon certain immutable and eternal principles. Hobbes, Spinoza, and Helvetius were too wise men not to know this. Hobbes, however, saw it the clearest of the three. Nations have their duties as well as individuals, and those duties are not merely negative, consisting in the propriety of not injuring each other, but they are positive also, and consist in the performance of certain mutual good offices. Many of these good offices are determinable and evident. Where the selfish principle coincides in its effects with the dictates of a higher morality, it is an accidental circumstance. The old classification of laudable actions and the reduction of them into points of A. Wisdom, B. Courage, C. Justice, and D. Moderation is preferable to the modern mode of bringing all things under the heads of A. Duty towards oneself, b. duty towards one's neighbor, and c. duty towards one's maker. Morality is a matter of reason in its highest sense, and not in that of the Benthamites, who make it synonymous with calculation. But what is the end and aim of reason? Is it happiness? Is it enjoyment? Is it perfection, truth, harmony, unity, tranquility, union with God? Any of these or all. No matter what may be the particular aim, reason is the striving after a higher and a nobler state, where the excitement of the operation is its own great reward. Individuals are mortal, and as such need religion to assure them of a higher existence. But nations are immortal, though only in a certain degree. This limitation imposes upon them also the necessity of religion, of which the hierarchy are the conservators and the ruling powers the defenders and encouragers. No national morality absolute, but traversed by the national character. National character formed by no single accident, such as language, position, climate, etc., etc., 
but by a variety of them, most naturally divided into selfish and unselfish. Commerce and conquest coincident with selfish national characters. Unselfish national characters, either non-existent or found only in small districts, as the Pulu Islands, or isolated sects, as the Essenes. National character may be influenced for better or worse by causes within and by causes beyond our control. Causes beyond our control are the revolutions of nature and the inroads of conquering armies. Causes within our control are government, religion, and education. Tokens of honor, the only political means that a state possesses of forwarding the progress of improvement. Influence of traditional maxims, nations moral or immoral, in proportion to their enlightenment. A people in the lowest grade of civilization, no more moral or immoral than an infant. Virtue, in the sense of the ancients, a mental operation. Physical courage, as well in war as in other cases, reducible to an operation of the mind, and that not because it arises, as shown in a contempt of death, from a belief in a forthcoming immortality, since many of the heroes of old, Rulf, Kraka, Frithiof, and Mezentius, were infidels, nor yet from a consciousness of our comparatively superior strength, since the antagonists of the old heroes were proportionable, puissant, but from our obedience to the voice of honor. Courage arising from anything but a moral principle is no virtue. Courage, fortitude, and patience that are forced upon us by the order of nature, such as the sick man's resignation, the Eskimox, Eskimos, contempt of cold, and the savage's endurance of hunger, are no true virtues. Readiness to receive impressions from others and to accommodate ourselves to their example is no true virtue. Energy hungers and thirsts after operation. It works, but it works after its own fashion and with its own instruments. In this it must not be let or hindered. It must be free of external restraints. Thus, the love of freedom is a national duty, and it must go hand in hand with strength and a proud consciousness of strength encroaching ambition less the vice of nations than of individuals. Virtue is modified by such external accidents as produce selfishness. Selfishness is not natural to man, but arising from the pressure of his necessities. Aims A. At subsistence. B. Enjoyment. C. Possession of property. National selfishness exhibited in those cases where one nation makes war upon another solely on the plea that that nation may become a dangerous enemy. This can arise only from one of two causes. A. The notion that the nation in point is of paramount importance, whilst the others are but as dust in the balance. B. Exaggerated ideas of the importance of self-protection. As the selfish aims are triple, so are the unselfish feelings reducible to three heads, justice, benevolence, and religion. Justice referable to the love of order. What is not beneficial to the whole cannot be truly so to an individual. Nations cannot make over their country as individuals can their property. Thus far, then, national and individual rights and the rules applicable thereto do not coincide international law undefined love of one's country limited on one side by selfish feelings and on the other by the more general one of universal benevolence grounded either upon our feelings or our duties no man can live without receiving either directly or indirectly good offices at the hands of his neighbors these he will owe rather to his fellow citizens than to anyone else Hence the sense of gratitude, or the moral grounds of love of one's country, considered as a duty. Security and well-being are not the sole and whole objects of nations, neither are the injunctions of international justice purely negative. Hence nations owe to each other something more than the mere abstinence from mutual injury, and that is the reciprocity of good offices. The means of working improvements in national characters are intellectual and spiritual cultivation. Add to the above the names of Schwag, Storm, Wolf, Pram, Zitzlitz, and Jurgord, all Northmen and all poets. 
End of Recording Norway and the Norwegians, Volume 2, Chapter 13 Trecho by Robert Gordon Lotha, 1840 Pages 149 to 100